Welcome to the One More Thing podcast. Today I'm joined with Dr. Troy Doucet. Thank you for being here. Always a pleasure, man. Good to be here. So New Year. Gosh, I'm forgetting this one. (laughs) Happy. Happy New Year. That's it. Happy New You. Um, So it was an excellent service, excellent uh, sermon, um, and uh, you got to kick off 2022 with the first sermon back from the, the weekend off and Christmas Eve. Yeah, man. Um, so what kind of, what led you in this path as far as setting the tone for the year? Yeah, you know, it was it was an honor for me to do it, to be the, the communicator to sort of set the tone and sort of the precedence of expectation, you know, for, for the year. And so I was honored to do it. And there was a lot of prep that went into it. And really the whole idea was to kind of center it and sort of situate it on the value of the church where we take responsibility. And I really challenged that old theological premise of Augustinian's original sin, right? That we somehow inherit the sin. And, you know, it's always bothered me. It never really seemed like a fair deck to be dealt by God, you know? And so I wanted to challenge that and really put the sense of responsibility back onto us as individuals. Like, we we are the ones who create and fill meaning within our life. And we can't blame others. Larry does a great job of, like the blame game. I wanted to kind of stay away from the blame game, maybe touch it, but say, hey, now let's own it, right? Right. And so uh, I thought the story of the woman with the issue of blood was one of those aspects of like society had given her a label, had given her 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 sense and identity. And she was like, no, this is not it. And so, you know, as Jesus passes by in that story, I loved what had happened with the prayer shawl, using that as an example and illustration, like she rose above what was expected of her and had a new sense of expectation based upon, you know, a sense of becoming like, you know, this is who I know I am and this ailment is not going to hold me back. Yeah. And so, you know, I said it at the end of the sermon, happy new you, which is the same you, right? But now you got to you got to own it. You got to become it. You got to take responsibility for it. So, well, it, it touched on a, a subject that I'm, you know, obviously I I love the the idea of personal responsibility, but I think one of the biggest damages of the church is the shame and the guilt mm-hmm. that has been propagated. You know, I obviously like I grew up my whole life feeling like a crap person. You know that the only way God could look at you is because you're covered in Jesus's blood and. When you when you free yourself from that idea of like I, what was the line that you said I am? It was something I I am loved by God. Oh, man, I, I'm not I'm not recalling it right now, but it yeah. was something to the effect of, um, it's not because I'm I'm worthless or yeah. dirt. What, what was that line? Yeah, there were a few a few points I tried to emphasize and really preach. You know, was the fact that. You know, I don't I don't have to view myself as being worthless. That's it. In order to view God as being worth everything. Yeah. I don't have to view myself as being evil in order to see God or to love God with everything I have. And so there's always this premise, man, with those with bad theology is that somehow I have to view myself as less in order to see God as more. Right. And it, I think it does a lot of harm psychologically. Sure. It, do, it does a lot of harm, um, you know, fundamentally to my sense of being and how I think God actually sees me versus how I'm I'm taught through this theological lens of how I should be seen as this depraved, mm-hmm. you know, this totally depraved, totally evil, full of sin. Um, when God says, no, you're good. Yeah. You're good. I love you. Yeah. I love you. I may not agree with some of the stuff you're doing right but you know it it goes back to one of the stories i told like you can't totalize my existence by my mistakes man exactly because i've done great things too with my life i've done good things i've told the truth and i want to totalize my life by the good things right and let those mistakes be sort of these auxiliary notions where i've i've fallen short and i didn't live up mm-hmm. to my own my own what am I trying to say? I didn't live up to my own expectations, much less God's. Right. And so to blame someone else for what I'm going through is, uh, I mean, it's a defeatist mentality, man. For sure. And I, you know, we obviously, <clears throat> we look at this, the scripture that, you know, Jesus talks about God being the father, you know, the loving father. And, you know, and you're a dad, I'm a dad. 
if one of our kids comes up to us every single day and is just like, Dad, I'm worthless. I'm evil. I made these mistakes today. I don't even know how you love me. Like, I'm just so worthless. You'd be concerned. Yeah. You'd be saddened by that mentality. Oh, yeah. Like, and you just want to get down and give your, your kid a hug and just be like, no. No, you're not. Yeah. You're not worthless. You're not evil. Yeah. I love you. I know you make mistakes. That's the love that we can kind of, we can picture. We yeah. are able to attain that type of love. So yeah. how much greater love is God for us? Yeah. You know, so we, I, I always like, always try to correlate that and remind people of that. And, and honestly, like music wise, it's really hard to find music that we could do that isn't like, I'm worthless, I'm yeah. worthless, I'm worthless, I'm worthless. You're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome, but me. Yeah. yeah. So it, it really, and, but thankfully there has been a movement within the, in the worship world of new music coming out that says like, like Fountain, that says, yeah. I'm good because you say I'm good. That's right. I am worthy, I am loved by you. Yep. You know, and, and that unfortunately is hard, to, it's hard yeah. to find. So it's so embedded and baked into, uh, what you would consider good theology. That's right. Of I'm a worthless piece of crap and God is awesome. And he, it's just not good. It's not a, it's not good for you and your own psyche yeah. and your own expectation of like, no matter what I do, I'm always going to be a piece of crap. That's right. Yeah. And I think that was, again, one of the main points is, of the sermon was God loves you exactly as you are, but he also loves you too much to stay where you are. Exactly. And this sense of newness is, is not like something that's been replaced, right? I think it's something that has sort of been maybe replenished, something that has been awakened within me. Love that. That, um, man, the same Christ spirit that was in Jesus is in you. And that's not you saying that. No. That's Jesus saying that's that. Jesus himself. <laughs> that's Jesus. Those, those are his words. He, but, you know, the idea, man, I mean, the whole idea of like evangelicalism and fundamentalism, it it, it stems beyond just interpretation of particular scriptures. It, it goes into a manifestation of control and power and, mm -hmm. and these things. One of my favorite philosophers, Michel Foucault, talks a lot about. And so for me, is that's not freedom. That's not freedom. And freedom doesn't mean because I know I'm forgiven and because I know I'm good, it gives me a license to go and just harm everyone. Exactly. Like that's ridiculous, man. Right. That's, the, that's, that's beyond slippery slope. Mm -hmm. I think what that does is true freedom is I recognize my identity as God sees me and it awakens within me this Christ spirit that maybe has been dormant or not as, as prevalent as it could be. And it doesn't mean I go out and harm or I go out and just have a license to, to do whatever. It means I take responsibility for that that gift. And you and you identify, like, I am able to do those things. Yes. I am capable of doing those bad things. But in spite of that, That's right. I choose. It, it, it's psychologically is so much better. That's right. Like, you've identified, like, I am capable of this. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a lot of modern theology disregards modern psychology. Yeah. <laughs> As being somehow uh, like black magic of some sort. Sure. No, we know. We know that no one wakes up from their sleep and goes, today, a pedophile. That sounds like a great career yeah. option or a serial killer. That sounds like a great career move. No one does that. We know that there are mental deficiencies. We know that there are social effects that happen to people. And it's that old debate nature versus nurture and we we've answered that we've answered that psychologically we know that things happen in people's lives which steer them towards paths of darkness or evil whatever you want to label it and when there's no interference to bring them back that's when bad things happen but no one wakes up and goes i'm gonna kill everybody today right if that happens something has happened prior to that and i think the fear of evangelicalism is the fact that we can't tell people that they're good Hmm. We can't because then they might go bad. Well, I mean, that's dude. What a what a what a depraved way sure. to look at God's creation, right? Yeah. In light of that whole original sin thing, which I I hoped I 
Yeah, I wanted to, to break waiver. that. I wanted to break that down a little bit because I know you were kind of strapped for time. Yeah, yeah. So I think with the one more thing, this is a perfect opportunity yeah. for people because I had a couple of questions. There's some people that come to the church uh, that are new to the Christian Christian world. They haven't heard a lot of these concepts like original sin. Yeah. So break down the idea of original sin, what that is, where it comes from, how it perverted, you know, even yeah. or Christianity and Jesus's message. Well, there's always been a mystery as to what is the source, what is the the grounding, the origination to our problems. Like, why are we so freaking selfish at times? Why do we choose to harm people we even love and care about, much less strangers? And theologians have debated, you know, as to what's the grounding of that. Psychologists have debated it. But, you know, I think it was like uh, 1400s, you know, 13th century, uh, St. Augustine wrote a book uh, City of God, where he tries to, again, bring some sort of constitution theologically to this understanding, and he coins the term original sin, where he places this sort of almost like a genetic inheritance of sin right. from Adam to all generations of humans. Now, again, there's a lot of... For the apple. For yeah, eating you, of the yeah, apple. Right. You, and again, you have to make astronomical leaps of faith to accept that. Number one, you have to believe that there really was a guy named Adam who a rib was taken out of. Right. But modern genetics shows us that's, that's, ne- not, that's yeah. not possible. Right. That wasn't possible for there to be one human man, one human woman that existed on the entire planet, you know, at right. this given time. Right. And but that's Jew- a story for another that's day. That's another yeah. day. <laughs> but the idea is like that's where original sin starts. It doesn't start from, oh, this has been the church's position from the beginning. No, Judaism was the original prior to Christianity, and they have no notion of original sin. Yeah. That that was a story told. It wasn't about sin happening. It was that it happened, and that we are we identify ourselves in that sort of disobedience. No. We don't identify, we shouldn't identify as inheriting that disobedience, but Adams was eating the apple. Mm-hmm. Mine might be something else. Yours might be something else, right? Um, that was the whole point, was to say we all sort of are irresponsible at times. It was not to become this this overarching meta narrative that we all fall underneath to try to give an explanatory right. force behind why we all sin and why we all fall short. And it's been taken to a literal conclusion that Which has is, had it's so enormous inter- consequences. It's so interesting because it, the, the idea and the premise, and this has become doctrine, you know, you're talking about 1300 years after Christ. Yeah. But you, people, you ask people about original sin, and they act like it's in the Bible. Like, they act like this concept is, like, clearly stated in the Bible. Obviously, they're drawing from the biblical story. Mm-hmm. But this idea that you're automatically guilty yeah. of the original sin, of yeah. the original sin of Adam because you were born. Yeah, you're born with it. You're born with it. Yeah. Like, how fair is that? Well, it, it, it's not even yeah. just about... How just is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, it's like this idea of, like... I, I don't know it, because I, it just doesn't seem to, to matter that it's not biblical. It's just it's already been implanted into this idea of like this is what Christianity is. Yeah, um, it's it's sort you're required to believe it. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of a requ- it's you know required reading in certain classes in in certain evangelical circles of theology. This is required belief, right? Right, and. Uh, yeah, and, and to question it, you know, I was talking with Pastor Brett earlier. We're trying to get some some sort of verbiage, and I, I just want to say this: doubt is not a bad word. Questioning is not a bad thing. In fact, this is how humanity propels itself into the future and makes life better: is by having doubts, by having skeptics, by having people who question those things which have been, you know, fermented and galvanized. And I hope I did that on Sunday, man. Was to you bring did an the excellent question. job, man. Thanks, you brought, man. You brought the heat. And um, I told, I was talking to my boy Nick in the Grand Hall after ten thirty, um, and he was he was one of the guys that was just having some questions. He's like, you know, I just I don't know a lot about some of this stuff. Like, where should I start learning mm-hmm. uh, about the Bible? Yeah. You know. And so I, I was telling him like. 
you know, we could, you could start with the Bible, you know, and, yeah. and he was asking about a good uh, version that would be like a good readable like thing. And I told him about Jordan Peterson's uh, biblical series. I yep. thought that was a really good, um, it's a lot. Yeah. Like it's a lot. It's three hours each, man. Three yeah. hours each. And I think it's there's like 16 videos, yeah, it's a but he dedicated so much time to breaking down the, a lot of the major Genesis stories, which I think, yeah. you know, he does an amazing job. Um, so I recommended NIV and NLT, uh, versions of the Bible, uh, cause they're very easy to, to type, to read and mm-hmm. understand. Um, do you, if there anybody else in the audience that's like wondering like where they can learn a lot of this, like yeah. foundational theological, um, ideas, where do you, do you have anything else that you can like point them in a direction that's like, yeah, man, I think, you know, I always I like the guys who start from the skeptical position. They say, I'm, I'm coming in with as little bias as possible. So someone like a like a John Shelby Spong, right? Mm-hmm. Some, some of his books are... Larry's a big fan of him. Yes, it, they're very accessible, right? They're scholarly, but accessible. They're not written with a vernacular that is only for the elite theologian, yeah, like, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, Rob Bell's stuff is really cool, really down to earth and accessible, and he gets a lot of crap for some of the stuff he writes. But look, man, um, it's it's brilliant stuff. Um, obviously, like Brian McLaren, who mm-hmm. we had, some of his stuff is again really approachable, and he's asking good questions, right? right. He's asking good questions. And so those three guys would be where I'd start. And if you want to get like deeper into the scholarly world, someone like Bart Ehrman would be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Jordan Peterson stuff is, you yeah. know, you have to have that commitment to watch those videos, yeah. but they're absolutely enlightening. Yeah. And uh, But that's that would be where I'd start, man, to begin this process of asking questions, right? right. Don't just accept blindly because this is what we've been taught. Right. And you know, a pastor hammered down hard enough that it scared you into believing this. So. Right. Well, yeah. I, and you know, obviously, I told him, you know, the for somebody that doesn't know even some of the the, the more popular basic biblical stories, you know, just yeah. I told him read the Gospels, you know, and you get to hear the story of Jesus, you know, through these four Gospels. Um, you get to hear all the famous s- stories about him, obviously yeah. from his his birth to the Sermon on the Mount to the miracles that he performed to his death. Yeah. Um, you I know. think that's good advice to give your friend, man. Cause, yeah. cause again, not to bring up Michel Foucault again, but like he, he, for me, the text stands as it is. You can try to, you can try to, again, situate it through an interpretive lens where they're talking about a historical, what's the his- historical background? What's the authorial intent? Mm-hmm. What's the cultural significance? What's the, the Jewish significance, which I used again, a prayer shawl. Right. Like, no, just read it. Mm-hmm. Just read it. Because the way I say about the scriptures or any text, like reading a book, dude, is a freaking traumatic event. It should mess with you, no right. matter what the book is, whether I'm reading Sam Harris or whether I'm reading Daniel Dennett or whatever, or if I'm reading the Bible. I have a brain. I have my own background that I bring to the text. And so what happens is as I read, particularly like the Gospels, the way I say it is I don't read the Bible. The Bible reads me. And when I identify myself within that story, whether I'm the woman with the issue of blood or whether I'm Peter going, man, everybody's touching you. I don't know what's going on. (laughs) Just kind of dazed and confused. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let it read you. And then you dig deeper and you can find historical situations or cultural relevance. But you need that foundation because it's like you can start, like if you don't know the stories. Yeah. Read then the you stories, can't, you can't be critical that's of it. the stories or at least dive deeper into the stories, right? And I think yeah. that's one of the beautiful things Jordan Peterson does is it's like, okay, we have the foundation of the Genesis stories, right? Yep. You know, we have the creation, we have the garden, we have um, Noah, we have all these like famous stories within the Genesis text. And then he like breaks down, okay, yep. we're, we're reading this as a historical book. We can prove that it's not, yep. but let's not take it as at this, yeah. at this face value, like let's dive deeper into the meaning. So not only does he dive into the historical yeah. aspect of it, but he's like, they're intertwining these beautiful stories within this Jewish um, culture that has so much more, more significance and beauty and poetry. He's oh, like, yeah. this is the most important book yeah. that has ever been written. 
Yeah. And so he makes you excited about oh, yeah. the Bible again. Um, so, and I think that's where like guys like you, guys like Pastor Larry, guys like Brett, you guys are passionate about it because it's like, man, you Christianity has done a disservice by oh, yeah. looking at the Bible as it has. Yeah. This is a beautiful, beautiful book that has amazing stories and amazing value to our life. Mm-hmm. When we take things out of context and we use this and we weaponize the Bible to hate gay people. Yeah, harm. Yeah. Harm people is like, man, you're you're misusing this. Yeah. This is not this is not cool. And I think that's what's so important about the message that so many people are coming out now and saying, you know, this is we need to stop doing this. That's right. And we're just starting, man. That's what's that's what's beautiful. That's you know, it. we're cranking this year up the right way, I think. So I, I agree, man. You you set the tone for the year and I'm I'm really excited. Let's go. Um so we have a new series coming up. I, yes. I don't think we're supposed to say the name. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Game of Thrones, man. Game of Thrones. Yeah, it's all about the the, the, the seat the seat of the throne, right? Yeah. The, the power that we give over to our life. You know, this old, what is it? The old, um, the native proverb, the wolf you feed is the wolf that grows. And we're kind of taking that premise with the thrones, like the throne of our heart. Like where, who sits on that throne, man? Mm-hmm. Is it is it for the kingdom of God or is it for, you know, the castle of self, right? The way I'll say it is there's the kingdom of God and there's the castle of the self. And those are diametrically opposed to each other. You know, there's a, there's there's a better way to live, and that's to love. I know? love it. I'm so, excited. Well, yeah, man. thank you so much for being on the one more thing. Awesome, man. Thanks. Thanks.